All right, so we are going to start looking at nationalism today and tomorrow. Um, we are going to do these notes in two parts. So today, if you're looking at your notes, we're only going to fill out this first page. So we are going to pick up with nationalism and the state of Europe after French, uh, the French Revolution. So um, a little review. The last time we looked at the state of Europe, we were discussing the fall of Napoleon. And we said after the fall of Napoleon, um, there was a meeting of these rulers in Europe um, with the Congress of Vienna. And the goal of the Congress of Vienna was to, of course, restrict the power of France because under Napoleon, France had um, expanded its borders and be uh, become a major empire and had conquered a lot of Western Europe. And so obviously it's to restrict France back to what it was before Napoleon. Um, but not to take too much from the French that they would become resentful and seek revenge. So the Congress of Vienna was actually very successful in, in doing that. They were able to restore stability to Europe. Um, and these conservative rulers were able to maintain and return to power in these other countries that the French had expanded into. The underlying fear um, under or, or during the Congress of Vienna was that these conservative rulers who were present at the Congress um, were now that they've seen the American Revolution and they've also seen the French Revolution, both successful in different ways, um, but both are fueled by these um, enlightenment ideas and these ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, um, democracy. Um, a lot of these conservative rulers, because they're monarchs that rule other empires throughout Europe, um, were concerned that these ideas would spread and particularly spread to their country, obviously, you know, could remove them from power. And they've seen the um, aftermath of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Um, so these conservative rulers in Europe decide to make an agreement. This is called the Concert of Europe that in the, in the event that there is a revolution in their country, they're going to come to each other's aid. This won't necessarily stop the revolutions from happening or make them any more unsuccessful. Um, but this is an attempt to try to um, maintain their power throughout Europe. So meanwhile, these revolutionary ideas are going to spread throughout Europe um, and beyond to colonies in Latin America. So today, specifically, you guys are going to focus on those revolutions in Latin America, and you guys are going to fill out a chart on that. So we're not going to go into too much detail um, on them here because you guys are going to do a reading on those. Um, but we're going to kind of focus on the effects, at what nationalism is, and the effects that it's going to have on Europe here in these notes. Because tomorrow we're going to look at the unification of Germany and Italy. So <clears throat> after these um, revolutions spread to Latin America, a lot of these Latin American countries do earn their independence from these major um, empires. And so they are no longer colonies, but they are their own independent nation states. Um, meanwhile, in Europe, nationalism is starting to spread. So as a review, um, nationalism is this feeling that you know the greatest loyalty of a person should not be to a monarch. As remember, we've been looking at the spread of these enlightenment ideas but rather their loyalty is going to be to a group of people who share a common culture with them, a common history. And so nationalism can take different forms. It can be something that unifies a group of people. So we'll see countries like Germany and Italy unify, but it can also be something that divides um, a country. And so that's what, or an empire mainly. And that's, so what, that's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at how nationalism is going to divide um, and really weaken some of these major powers. The first nationalist revolution we're going to look at is in Greece. Um, so Greece is in a region that we call the Balkan Peninsula. The Balkan Peninsula later on is going to be known as the powder keg of Europe, just because there's so many different ethnic groups that are present in that area. Um, and so that particular area is controlled by the Ottomans at this time in the early 1800s. And so the Greeks are going to revolt against the Ottoman Empire, and the Greeks are going to successfully guarantee their independence by 1830. So in this case, we're going to see that nationalism separated um, the Greeks from the Ottoman Empire, and they were able to establish their own independence. Okay, so this is an example of how nationalism can be a separating force. In this case, the Greeks are separating themselves from the Ottoman Empire. Um, in 1830, um, Charles X of France is going to try to reinstate absolute monarchy. So <laughs> if we are remembering correctly, right? The French have just gone through a revolution not too long ago. They've also seen the rise and fall of Napoleon. Um, and so 
this idea of absolute monarchy, after, especially after the French Revolution and after Napoleon's, um, you know, declaring himself uh, emperor as well. This is not going to sit well with the French people. Um, so the July Revolution occurs. Um, they're going to um, overthrow Charles and play, replace him with his brother, um, Louis Philippe. And so these two revolutions specifically, um, the ability of Greece to separate from uh, the Ottoman Empire and the French being able to um, prevent their ruler from exercising absolute power is going to inspire future nationalist revolutions across Europe. Okay, so um, again, we're going to see that some of these revolutions right now, um, with the exception of the, the Greeks, are going to be unsuccessful. But later on, we're going to still see the effects of nationalism um, in uh, Unit 7 when we talk about the beginning of World War I. All right, so in 1848, the French have a second revolution. Um, the uh, successor that they had put in place, Louis Philippe, uh, lost his popularity. And so uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte is the new president. So again, we have an exchange or a change in power in France. Um, I'm just going quickly through this because I want to focus elsewhere. Um, but France starts to, again, inspire nationalist movements throughout Europe. So let's take a look here because this is where I want to focus on. So you can see on this map, um, the revolutions are represented by these uh, red marks right here. Um, but you can see the major empires um, in uh, Europe as well. Where I'm going to focus really quick is the Austrian Empire. So the Austrian Empire, you notice, is one of the largest empires with the exception of obviously Russia. Um, <clears throat> And you can see down here, the Ottoman Empire is still pretty large. And you can see that here's Greece. Greece had declared its independence, right? Um, but if we look at Austria a little bit closer, okay, so going back, we're, oops, sorry. We are focusing on this particular empire. If you look at Austria and we break it down by ethnic groups, Austria is made up of several different ethnic groups. Um, the largest of these ethnic groups are going to be the Hungarians. Okay, so this is the largest minority group that is going to be present in Austria. And so remember, these feelings of nationalism are going to start spreading. And so a lot of these groups in this unit, the end of this unit with unit six, and then the beginning of unit seven, we're going to see that nationalism, again, is going to be this force that can really challenge traditional power, traditional authority, and it can be something that unifies a group of people like we're going to see with Italy and Germany, where they're going to unify their countries of um, people who share that common culture and common history. Um, and then we can see that it's going to be a dividing force, just like it was with the Ottoman Empire and Greece or the Greek um, or the Greeks. Um, so if we focus here, the Austrian Empire, again, we have so many ethnic groups that are present within the Austrian Empire, um, all under control, one ruler. And I said the largest minority group there is the Hungarians. And so the result of some of these um, revolutions in or attempted revolutions rather in the Austrian Empire is that the Austrian Empire is going to um, divide itself into two states, so two nation states, with one ruler. So the Hungarians don't necessarily get their separate nation state, but they get a separate state um, where they are still ruled by one same ruler. Okay, so from now on, Austria, the Austrian Empire is going to be the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's going to remain this way until we get to World War I, and we're going to talk about that later on, kind of the repercussions of that and not granting them um, their own territory, not allowing them to unify. Um, the Ottoman Empire, we'll see, is going to continue to experience tension between ethnic groups. And again, these two I want us to kind of just keep in mind because this is going to come into play when we get into the causes of World War I. The problem is, is that when they... The Congress of Vienna, when they redrew the borders, they were trying to stabilize Europe, basically keep it the same. Um, these conservative rulers are trying to keep their power. And so it creates tension because even when they're redrawing these borders, they're not considering granting independence to these people who have um, or 
or are, are of different ethnic groups and who may want their own independent countries, independent nation states. Um, so this is the, the issue that we're looking at. So this with um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now the Ottoman Empire is going to be something um, that is going to continue to cause tension throughout Europe all the way leading up to World War One. And then we have the Russian Empire. So we said that, you know, the Austri Austrian Empire was pretty large um, after the Congress of Vienna, with the exception of the Russian Empire, also very large. There's 22 million people living in Russia, in the Russian Empire, that aren't Russians. Um, so they don't consider themselves, you know, ethnically similar to that of the Russians. Um, due to the outbreak of revolutions, um, the Tsar is going to enforce something called Russification where he's going to try to force um, the uh, Russian culture on all of these different ethnic groups that are present in Russia. Um, you can't really force a culture on people. You can't force them to adopt a different kind of culture, especially if they identify differently. And so the result is that this is going to continue to weaken Russia. Again, leading up to um, World War I, when we're seeing Unit 7, Russia is going to be, even though it's a really large empire, it's incredibly weak as far as leadership. And so we're going to see another major revolution in Russia. Um, and we're going to see that the imperial family is going to be removed and unfortunately um, brutally murdered. Um, but we're going to see, again, the, um, the challenge of traditional authority. They're going to remove that traditional power in um, Russia as well. So all of this is going to lead up to Unit 7. All right, so this is where we're going to stop today with nationalism. You guys are going to do a chart on the nationalist um, revolutions in Latin America.